Hi there. In one of my previous videos, I used my power meter to check the power consumption of an emergency light and found that the current was lower than the threshold of 20 milliamps for the power meter to display and calculate the power factor. It just shows 0 for current and 1 for power factor. Using an external multimeter, I did then measure the current of around 16 milliamps and with the displayed voltage and real power number, calculated the power factor was really 0 0.44. Although this is already the most sensitive power meter I found, it is still designed to measure up to 100 amps or power of 22 kilowatts because its chipset is meant for smart meters, measuring the consumption of a whole house or apartment. And while it's fully aware of even tiny loads of just 16 milliamps because it's still calculating real power use, it doesn't bother with calculating the power factor of loads below 20 milliamps or about 5 watts. In this video, I'm showing a modification to increase the sensitivity so that the power factor is still displayed for currents as low as 2 milliamps or about 0.5 watts of power. But before that, there's a wiring mistake I made in my original video of the power meter and if you build it, you should fix the wiring even if you don't do the rest of the changes I'm going to suggest. Here's a still from the build of the original power meter. If you have not seen that video, you may want to use the link on the screen now. As you can see, in the original wiring, I tapped the live power for the module, which is the thin brown wire, from the white outlet socket on the front panel because it was conveniently located. The problem is that the current drawn by the module flows from the inlet at the bottom through the thick brown live wire through the core to the outlet and then to the module. So the module's own consumption was always included in the measurement. I don't think I ever measured what current the module itself uses. Let's do that now. After the inrush current settles, we have about 1.7 milliamps. That is tiny, so the error caused by the wiring mistake is very small, but still something that can be easily avoided by tapping the power for the module from the other end of the live wire. As you can see, I have simply moved the thin brown wire feeding the module from the outlet to the inlet, so the current is no longer passing through the transformer. To fix the sensitivity for low currents, Jens, one of my viewers, suggested by adding more turns to the current transformer, the unit's sensitivity might be increased to the point of getting the power factor readings even at very low currents. Let's see why this should work. The power meter uses a current transformer as a sensor. As designed right now, the AC current to be measured travels through the single orange colored loop through the center of the transformer and induces a current in the blue secondary coil that can be measured. The formula for current transformers shows that the secondary current is proportional to the ratio of the number of primary turns over the turns in the secondary coil. If, as in the original design, the number of primary turns is 1 and the number of turns in the secondary is n, it becomes 1 over n. In the original video, I showed that n out was 1000 turns. So, 1 amp current in the primary will induce 1 milliamp in the secondary and at full range, 100 amps will induce 100 milliamps. In the case we are interested in, 20 milliamps in the primary causes only 20 microamps in the secondary and anything below is no longer producing a power factor calculation. If we loop the orange wire 10 times around the core, we have changed the ratio from 1 to 1000 to 10 to 1000, which is the same as 1 to 100. The 20 milliamps now cause 200 microamps secondary current and the new low threshold for power factor is 2 milliamps. Great, in theory nothing would stop us to boost the sensitivity further, except 
to physical squeeze, say, 100 windings of decently sized wire with enough current carrying capability through a tiny core. Further, even with just 10 windings of instead of 1, we have already lost the ability to measure currents from 10 amps to 100 amps. Because we would exceed the 100 milliamp input limit of the module. Given that standard UK power sockets are rated for 13 amps and US sockets for 12 amps, overloads followed by magic smoke from the modified meter are now a very real possibility. The way to avoid this, or at least reduce the likelihood, is to implement both primary windings and a switch to choose between them. Just don't forget to always start in the times one setting and only switch to the more sensitive times 10 mode if the current is less than 10 amps. There are two ways of implementing this ride and many more ways of getting it wrong, so let's look at the wiring in more detail. Relatively simple is the two independent primaries method shown here on the left. Depending on the switch setting, either the times one winding or the times 10 winding passing the current, but they are never both active at the same time. The advantage is that you don't have to worry about getting the winding orientation right. In this case shown here, the current flows the opposite way in the times 1 winding and the 10 winding coil, but it doesn't matter because it's AC and only one is in use at any time. The drawback is that you have to get both 1 and 10 windings through the core. In the series wiring on the right, we must use one winding less because as you see, the current always flows through the times 1 winding coil. And if the switch is in the times 10 position, there are 9 additional windings added for a total of 10. If this wiring is chosen, it is crucial to pay attention to the wiring orientation. The times 1 winding and 9 winding must have the same orientation. That is, the 9 wires must continue going around the core in the same way as the 1 winding. If you change direction, the windings will not add up to 10, but 8 because the magnetic fields cancel each other. The tricky thing on getting the number or orientation of the windings wrong is that the meter still works, it just shows the wrong values. The way to test this is to measure a load with a current over 20 milliamps in the times 1 position and check that in the times 10 position you get 10 times as much and not 8, 9 or 11 times. In my opinion, the series method is definitely more elegant, but the independent method is less error prone and that's why I selected it for my meter. Let's talk about the switch for a moment. You need what is known as a single pole double throw or SPDT model to select between the two windings. There is this one rated for 2 amps at 250 volts. And then there is that one, 15 amps at 250 volts. The switch needs to handle the full voltage and current of the largest load you ever plan to measure with your meter. In my case, UK mains 13 amps. So there isn't a question which one will become the meter's range selector and which will go back into the parts bin. It happens not often, but sometimes you get lucky. Despite being so large, the switch just fits neatly on the most right part of the front panel. I printed a label on a piece of paper put some clear protective film on it and glued it on the front panel. The additional 10 winding coil is a bit messy, but in part it's because I use 1.5 square millimeter flex rated for 16 amps for all the load carrying wires and this wire is quite stiff. The times one winding is just a straight wire going through the core. I decided to use the same diameter cable for times one and times 10 instead of thinner wire because you never know. You may have left it in the times 10 setting when connecting to a large load like a heater. That way I don't have to worry that the times 10 windings are going to get hot and melt. Speaking of melting, because we can now easily exceed the 100 milliamp rating of the module, I decided to add an F rated 100 milliamp glass fuse into the connection between the secondary and the module as protection from overloads in the times 10 mode. 
according to the datasheet, a 100 milliamp F fuse will last a minimum of 60 minutes at 150% load, so even longer tests at the upper limit of the full range should not cause the fuse to melt too early. To measure the current coming out of the transformer secondary in times 1 and times 10 setting, I tap the connection to the module and put the multimeter in series. I have connected a heater to the meter, but only the fan is running. We are seeing a current of 0.18 amps, 32.6 watts and a power factor of about 0.75. The multimeter shows the expected transformer output of 0.18 milliamps. Switching to times 10 and we see that both current and watts are 10 times larger and the multimeter confirms the factor of 10. This is a good test to see if the number of windings is correct. Back in times 1 mode and I have switched the first stage of the heater on. The power is slightly above 1 kW and the current is 4.4 amps. The transformer current is 4.4 mA as expected. Switching to times 10 and we are now showing 44 amps and 10.3 kW. The transformer current is now 44 mA. Back in times 1 mode and the heater is now at its maximum of slightly below 2 kW. The current is 8.3 amps, which 1000 times less showing on the multimeter. We should remain below 100 milliamps, so there is no danger in going to times 10. The switch has to shift 8.3 amps from the times 1 to the times 10 winding. This is why I selected a beefy switch and used thick cabling even for the times 10 winding. I ran this test mainly to confirm that the theory works and that the number of windings in the times 10 mode is correct. In reality, for loads like this, you don't need a times 10 mode. That becomes useful at much lower currents and no, I'm not going to remove the emergency light that sparked this change from the ceiling and measure it again. But I found a perfect replacement in form of this cheap Chinese desk lamp from eBay. I bought it some time ago for tricky soldering jobs because it has a dust protected magnifying glass claimed to be times 5 if I remember, although it does seem to be less, and a string of 40 LEDs to illuminate the work area. This is how it looks inside. The mains cord is my replacement because the original one and the molded unfused UK plug were both criminally unsafe. Anyway, the point here is the power supply, which is unsurprisingly a textbook capacitor dropper. You can see the orange capacitor 0.22 microfarad with a discharge resistor across, a discrete full bridge rectifier made of four diodes, two current limiting resistors and a green 4.7 microfarad smoothing capacitor. Somewhat gingerly as this whole thing is live mains, I measured the voltage to the 40 LEDs as 110 volts, so obviously they are all in series, which makes 2.75 volts per LED. And using a clamp meter, the current to the LEDs is only around 6 milliamps. This means the lamp uses a whopping 0.66 watt light source, but I do admit it's bright enough. And such low currents are right at the limit of the clamp meter, so it might be 9 milliamps, which makes the lamp a 1 watt light. I am measuring the mains current drawn by the lamp with this kind of scary arrangement, which you should never do at home unless you know what you're doing. We have about 12 milliamps, so now we know what to expect when using the power meter for this job. As expected, with 12 milliamp current draw, in times 1 mode, we see no current and the power factor is the default of 1. When we switch to times 10 mode, we see 12 milliamps. Remember, we need to shift the decimal point in times 10 mode. The power factor is now 0.4, which makes a lot more sense in this capacitor dropper. I call this a success. Thanks again to Jens for suggesting this modification and thanks for watching.